Welcome to this session of MD310 Medical Care Provider. In this session, we discuss thoracic trauma. By the end of this session, you'll be able to identify at least four intrathoracic anatomical structures that are at risk for injury and list five common thoracic injuries and identify the signs and symptoms of each and describe and perform the treatment of each. We'll briefly review the anatomy of the thoracic cavity. On the left, we have two cross-sectional CAT scans. The upper one shows a higher cut in the thorax. You can see lungs on both sides, the sternum in the front, and the large white midline structures show the aorta, which travels from the right superiorly to the left posteriorly, right along the spine. That's the aortic arch. And as we go a little bit further down, you can see the heart in the center of the chest, the lungs on both sides, and the aorta between the heart and the spine. So as you can see, further up in the chest, the aorta is an anterior to posterior structure. Low in the chest, it's a posterior structure. The heart is an anterior structure. You've got the lungs themselves. Surrounding the lungs are the pleura, which are at risk for injury. As we look at this coronal view on the right, we can see all the bones, the clavicles up high, and the ribs. You see the lungs, they're black on this CT image because we're looking at a slightly different way of looking at the uh, organs so we can see the organs themselves a little more easily. In the center, you can see the aorta. You can actually see the aortic root and valve going into the left ventricle. You can see the right ventricle and the return of the superior vena cava, the diaphragm along the bottom, and then in the lower part, you can actually see the stomach and the liver. Thoracic trauma can, of course, present with either blunt or penetrating trauma. Sometimes the problem is very obvious. An open chest wound, an airway obstruction, which can be subtle but may not be, being unable to ventilate would suggest that. Apnea or exsanguinating hemorrhage are all relatively obvious things that you would pick up on your XABCDEF survey. But the findings may also be very subtle. And we'll talk about some injuries that may take days or even weeks to present. So you need to maintain a high degree of suspicion anytime anybody suffers thoracic trauma. As always, your initial management of a trauma patient includes body substance isolation and scene safety. Make sure there's no hazards to you or the crew. You perform your survey for exsanguinating hemorrhage, airway, breathing, circulation, disability or neurologic status, exposure, and environmental protection, and finding clues. In the thoracic trauma patient, there's some things you may need to do immediately. These may include hemorrhage control, supplemental oxygen, and that becomes really important even for relatively minor to moderate chest trauma. Anything that compromises lung function can compromise the patient's ability to get oxygen into their bloodstream. And so providing supplemental oxygen early by nasal cannula if they're in no distress or by non-rebreather if really there's any suggestion of significant injury or they're in any distress is a good idea. You may need to support ventilation with bag valve mask ventilation and you may need to perform needle chest decompression during your initial survey and that would come up during the breathing section in a patient uh, in shock. So if you don't identify any immediate life threats, then you move on to your focused history and exam. And your exam, your vital signs, abnormalities could include rapid breathing. Could also include slow breathing, but you would have identified that typically during your initial assessment. High or low heart rates and hypoxia. On inspection, you're looking for swelling, tenderness, burns, lacerations, deformities, contusions, abrasions, and penetrations. Your stable decapitation or stable decap. You're looking for symmetry of the chest wall movement. The wall should move symmetrically, equally on both sides. If they don't, that's concerning. You're looking for paradoxical movements where part of the chest wall seems to be moving in the opposite direction from others. You're looking for retractions, that skin pulling in between the ribs, which shows you there's moderate respiratory distress. They're using more muscles than they normally would to breathe. You're looking at the tracheal position. Is the trachea in the midline? Uh, and at, that's at the level of the sternal notch. If you go down from the voice box or the larynx, you follow that down to the top of the sternum, the clavicles come together, 
There's a little notch there. The trachea, you can feel it with your fingertip, is in the midline, and you want to make sure it's in the midline. And cyanosis, is the patient turning blue? Hypoxia can be from many causes, but in chest trauma, you need to assume that there's some dysfunction or injury to the lung that's keeping the patient from being able to ventilate, bring in oxygenate, and get rid of carbon dioxide normally. On your physical exam, your palpation will show tenderness. It may show crepitance, that feeling of Rice Krispies popping beneath your fingers that tells you that there's air beneath the skin or if you're directly over a bone, potentially a fracture. Deformities in the chest wall or paradoxical movement. You can sometimes feel it when you can't see it uh, where one hand just isn't moving symmetrically and you look and it looks like and feels like that section is moving out when the rest goes in and vice versa. You want to auscultate for breath sounds, take a listen. You may hear completely normal sounds. You may hear abnormal sounds. And often in chest trauma, those abnormal sounds will be very focal, only in one area, because that's the area of the injury. And you want to see if you hear symmetric sounds. Sometimes you'll hear no sounds at all on one side or very different sounds on one side than the other. And then you just you need to test the patient's ability to speak. If they can't have so much respiratory distress they can't even speak normally, that's very concerning. Now here's the really important point. It doesn't matter what the injury is if the patient's sick. So you need to evacuate them immediately if they're sick. If the patient has signs of a severe chest injury, such as severe respiratory distress or extreme pain in the area of injury, a low blood pressure, a penetrating wound of the chest, or they've opened their chest up with an injury, they're coughing up blood, the one side of the chest isn't moving or one part of the chest isn't moving, or there are any of the signs of shock that we've uh, discussed in the shock section and in the general principles of trauma assessment, those are all red flags that you need to evacuate this patient. They need more care than you will be able to provide. There's really only a few injuries that have specific treatments, and even then, you still need to evacuate those patients. When you classify thoracic trauma, you can classify it either by the organ system that's injured or by mechanism and exam. And for you, not really being able to assess the underlying organs, you'll mostly classify by mechanism and exam. But it's useful to know what organ systems can be injured because you can predict injuries based on the mechanism of injury when you're tracking patients over time, you can determine what injuries you might expect to see and so predict what signs and symptoms they might develop. And it makes it easier for you to figure out what their risk of dying are if you can tell what you think could be injured. So by organ system, the skeletal system, the trachea or the lungs can be injured, the heart or the great vessels such as the aorta and the vena cava, those are the obvious ones, but as you move up in the chest, under the collarbones, you've got the subclavian arteries and veins, and those can be injured. And in fact, if the, they're torn, the patient can actually bleed to death into their chest. Uh, if you go a little higher up into the lower part of the neck, where you're still in the chest cavity more or less, the carotid arteries and the jugular veins are coming in. The diaphragm can be ruptured and the esophagus or food pipe can be torn as well. And that can be a very subtle injury that takes days, sometimes weeks to show up. Again, you'll be classifying mostly by mechanism and exam. And so we talk about blunt or penetrating injuries. With blunt injuries, they can be open if there was significant force and the chest tore open or closed. For penetrating injuries, they can be open or there can be impaled objects. Reading the scene is a very important part of what you do to determine injuries. So this is a motor vehicle crash, obviously, a car crash. You see blood everywhere. You see that the steering wheel was either cut out or torn loose, which would suggest significant forces to the chest. The seat has been pushed forward relative to the dash, so you know there were compressive forces against the chest and abdomen. The shirt was cut off on scene. It's bloody. So that suggests there were significant injuries there as well. And you can see extensive damage to the vehicle itself, all of which suggests tremendous force transmitted to the patient. Before we start talking about the injuries themselves, 
we talk quite a bit about pain control, and pain control is really important. Patients need to be able to continue breathing, and they need to be able to ventilate well to keep from getting atelectasis where the alveoli collapse on themselves. So it's important to get good pain control, and typically for any significant injury, we're using opiates, so morphine. And this is great for pain control. It's not so good for respiratory status. People who get narcotics, uh, the opiates, their breathing slows down, and they don't breathe very effectively. That can be very dangerous. Morphine can also lower the blood pressure, which can be dangerous in shock. So use these in your injured patients. You need to achieve pain control, but use them with care and be aware that they can cause problems with breathing, and you may have to either give them a medication, naloxone, to reverse them slightly so that the patient breathes well, or you may need to breathe for the patient, and if their blood pressure drops, you may need to give them IV fluids to help bring them back up. So let's start by talking about skeletal injuries, fractures. And these, in isolation, typically won't require evacuation uh, unless you're unable to control the patient's pain or they're very complex fractures or they're open fractures. That is, the skin is broken over the fracture. We'll start by talking about the clavicle or the collarbone fracture. Very common, occurs in falls. It occurs with direct trauma to the collarbone. And you can see on this x-ray here, the collarbone is broken right in the middle. The ends are displaced. They look jagged. It looks bad. On exam, you see a big lump right over that area. But a very common fracture and not a lot you need to do for it. These hurt particularly with arm movement, and sometimes if they're way out at the end, it can be difficult to distinguish these from a shoulder dislocation. But usually you'll find signs of trauma, and you need to make sure that they have normal circulation, motor function, and sensory function in the hand beyond there, because you've got something called the brachial plexus, which lives under the collarbone, roughly in that area, and with enough force, you can injure that. And the brachial plexus is responsible for the nerve function in your, in your arm distal to that area. And so you potentially could get a brachial plexus injury. The treatment is pretty straightforward. You talk to medical control. As long as, there, as there's no other injuries, it's going to end up being pain control, uh, oral anti-inflammatories, maybe oral uh, narcotics or non-opioid, opioid-type medications and a sling to support that, and you may need a swath to hold the sling against the body if there's a good deal of discomfort or movement. Rib fractures are also very common, and they can occur not just from blunt force to the chest, but a lot of coughing, excessive coughing, is often the cause of rib fractures or costochondral separation where the cartilage that connects the muscles to the ribs tears can be very difficult to tell the two apart. The most commonly fractured ribs are the third through the eighth ribs. The ones below that aren't attached to the sternum, and so they can take more compressive force. And the first and second ribs, which hide up under your clavicle, take tremendous amount of force to break. They're small ribs. They're very strong. And if those are broken, that's a lot of force, and there's usually underlying lung injury. If there's significant trauma, you need to think about the lung being injured, the pleura being injured, and if it was a very significant mechanism of injury, high energy transfer, then you need to think about the possibility of there even being a cardiac injury. So your findings, this is going to be in a patient with trauma, there will be trauma with pain in the area of injury. Sometimes you don't see any gross trauma. Uh, you don't have to have bruising or other findings there. But if they had trauma in that area and it's tender and it's worse with breathing and it hurts more when you push on it, then you know you're in the right area. So here's a patient who suffered a significant chest injury to the upper right chest. And you can see those red arrows are all fractures. Uh, there's even a second rib fracture there. And that takes a lot of force to do that. But this is what rib fracture looks like. You can see the ribs are broken. Uh, there's jagged edges to them. They're not lined up properly with each other. And you can compare them to the ribs on the other side to see what normal ribs look like. Also on this x-ray, you can see that the lungs look different. The lung on the left is black, which is what you would normally expect on a chest x-ray. 
the lung on the right looks all white and fuzzy, and that's a sign of the lung underneath being significantly bruised. So you can see it took a lot of force to create this injury, and that force injured the lung underneath. So how do you treat rib fractures? Well, if there's significant trauma, and there's crepitus, there's paradoxical movement, or any signs of shock, abnormal vital signs, then it's evacuation. But if, if it seems like it's isolated rib fractures, no other significant injury, then contact medical control. Your goals are pain relief with oral pain medications and possibly topical lidocaine. And you can make a lidocaine ointment um, or jelly that will work quite well. It absorbs through the skin and it blocks the nerves which run along the ribs. We use things called lidocaine patches all the time on trauma patients, but they're tremendously expensive and you're not going to have them available. But if you have some lidocaine jelly or if you take a little bit of lidocaine and mix it in either with a zinc oxide to make an ointment or you mix it in with some water-soluble lubricant like KY to make a jelly, you can then put that on a 4x4 or a 2x2, put it over the area of the pain and then cover it with some kind of occlusive dressing. And you want to put it not directly on the area of pain, but about 5 or 6 centimeters behind so it absorbs through and blocks the nerves there. So the, the pain impulses, the pain signals can't go through those nerves back to the spine. So you put that on, it absorbs through, take it off for 12, um, after 12 hours and then put it back on after another 12 hours. That can be tremendously helpful. And you want to promote breathing. You want their pain to be controlled so they can take deep breaths because what happens if, is if they don't breathe deeply enough, the alveoli begin to collapse down. They get what's called atelectasis, and then they develop a pneumonia from that, and that's very bad with a rib fracture. You may find old chest binders or rib binders in your uh, medical supplies. I wouldn't throw them away because they might be useful for holding down dressings for an abdominal wound or some other big injury but do not bind the chest because that decreases ventilation and promotes pneumonia. That used to be the standard for rib fractures. We now know that that actually kills people, so we try to avoid that. Primum no no cherry, first do no harm. Now we have been talking about simple rib fractures, but you can get complex rib fractures. So in flail chest, you have two or more consecutive ribs that are fractured in two or more places each, and so there are segments of bone that are floating, in a sense, free from this surrounding bone, although they are attached by the muscles and the ligaments, so it's not like they're completely loose. And that section moves less than the adjoining rib cage. And what happens if the chest wall isn't expanding well? Well, you lose efficiency. So your, your chest isn't an efficient bellows. You don't bring in air well. And because it takes a fair amount of force to break the ribs in two or more places, uh, you usually have an underlying lung injury as well. In these x-rays, you can see flail sections. On the x-ray on the left, take a look at the right chest wall. Look at the ribs on the right. See if you can find the ones that are broken in two or more places. On the left, just take a look at the arrow. You can see the ribs that are broken in two or more places. One is pointed out. Look at the ribs surrounding that. And if you go on YouTube and look for paradoxical chest wall movement, uh, you'll be able to find good links that show you the actual physical findings of paradoxical movement. So what do you do for flail chest? Well, just because they have two or more ribs fractured in two or more places doesn't mean that they're in severe distress. It could be that it's only two fractures, that it was an isolated blow, there's not a significant underlying injury, and they're able to compensate for their decreased efficiency. But if they're in respiratory stress, you need to stabilize that flail segment. And we do that by basically attaching something rigid to the surrounding ribs that are intact, and then attaching that rigid thing to the flail section to try to get it to move with the surrounding chest. And the ideal thing would be able to sew it all together, but since you can't do that, what you'll use is a lot of tape, something rigid like a stick, that's long enough to cross over the injured section, secure on the uninjured section, and secure to the injured section. 
they need supplemental oxygen, and if they're in severe distress, positive pressure ventilation as well to help inflate the underlying lung. Contact medical control for pain control, and these patients will often need to be evacuated. And honestly, if they have a flail segment that is so minor that it's not causing them significant distress, you're not going to know that they need evacuation. You're not going to know that they have that significant injury. So it's the flail injuries that cause significant distress that you're going to identify and that you're going to need to arrange evacuation for. And of course, you can really break any part of the rib cage, including the sternum or breastbone. Uh, typically, it's a direct blow to the sternum that will do this. It can occur with severe compressive or shear forces. In isolation, these just hurt a lot. And we used to think these were incredibly high risk for cardiac injury, but in reality, uh, less than one in a hundred cause severe injury. Um, and that's typically because of how significant the blow was to the chest. About one and a half percent of these are associated with a cardiac rhythm problem, and those are typically not life threatening. So your findings are going to be trauma to the sternum, tenderness, you may feel crepitus, and that's not necessarily the rice crispy air beneath the skin crepitus, but the crepitus we describe in bones, which is the sensation of bone ends grinding against each other as you push on them. So here's a patient who suffered a sternal injury. You can see on the x-ray on the right, where the red arrow is, that the sternum doesn't follow its path continuously, but there's a little bit of a break in it. And on the CAT scan on the left, you get great images, and you can actually see the fracture right through the sternum there. And that's the line in the center. On the sides, those lines are where the ribs are connecting to the sternum with cartilage. If you look at the underlying vessels and the lungs, you don't see any significant uh, injury there. And actually, that black circle in the middle, just above the spine, is the trachea. So this is fairly high up in the chest. So treating a sternal fracture, if it's a simple isolated sternal fracture, you won't be able to tell the difference between a sternal fracture and just a chest wall bruise. So those don't get worried about so much if you can't really tell the difference. Um, if they're very tender in one spot, you feel crepitus, you know it's broken, or if they have a flail sternum, where the whole sternum has been broken free of the ribs and you're very concerned about that, then you need to do more. So for a flail sternum, you want to stabilize it and you do it the same way that you would for a flail segment of the chest. You anchor to the intact joining rib cage with a solid uh, item like a stick. You then anchor that in the middle to the sternum and hopefully that stabilizes the whole thing. Give them supplemental oxygen if they're having severe difficulty breathing, positive pressure ventilation. If you have EKG monitoring available, put the three lead monitor on or four lead monitor on. If you can do a 12 lead EKG, great. We discuss these things uh, in much greater depth in the medical PIC class. And then contact medical control. If there are any signs of significant injury, you're gonna to need to evacuate them. Even if they're not, and you're worried just about a chest wall contusion over the sternum, it's a very small fracture, and then you need to get, do pain control, which you'll need to do if you're going to evacuate them as well. Scapular or shoulder blade fractures are very problematic. This is a high energy injury. This is an incredibly tough bone, and usually it takes a direct blow to the scapula, although you can also get these fractures if you have a fall from height or a motorcycle accident where suddenly you grab on with one hand to stabilize yourself and there's a tremendous traction injury to that area. And that actually is called scapulothoracic dissociation where the whole shoulder blade can be torn off the ribs where it's attached in the back. These are usually associated with some lung injuries and sometimes with blood vessel injuries too depending on where the fracture is. And you will typically find evidence of trauma to the scapula the shoulder blade with severe pain and tenderness in that area. So this is a pretty dramatic scapula fracture. That red arrow points to where the scapula used to be attached to itself. And you can see that very rough looking edge. There's this smooth side coming up from the bottom of the scapula and then suddenly it stops in a very rough edge. And you can see turned inwards and displaced medially that upper fragment 
of the scapula that used to line up perfectly with where the red arrow was. So your treatment, X, A, B, C, D, E, F, after you've assured your own safety, talk to medical control about pain control, and you will need to evacuate these patients. Even if it seems like an isolated injury, it's a tremendous high energy injury. These patients can have delayed findings of pulmonary injury, uh, contusions and bruising to the lung that you don't want to deal with once they get really sick. And often these injuries are associated with a lot of other trauma. There's a direct blow to the scapula, but there's also trauma to the rest of the body, blunt trauma, um, or this is a gunshot wound or some other high velocity penetrating injury or low velocity penetrating injury that breaks the scapula and there's going to be other injuries you need to manage. So moving a little bit deeper into the chest, we'll start talking about pulmonary and peripulmonary injuries. And the first we'll talk about is a pneumothorax. As you probably remember, the lungs are not directly attached to the chest wall. Instead, there is a two-layer bag. One side is connected to the chest wall, the other side is connected to the ribs, and they're held together with essentially water tension, static electricity in a sense. So just like the bags at a grocery store that you put your fresh fruit and vegetables into, they cling together until you can break that connection between them and then they fill up with air easily. Well, the same thing happens with the pneumothorax. So your pleura, these pleural linings have an injury and air goes into that space. So now when the chest wall moves out, the outer pleura, the parietal pleura, moves with it. The visceral pleura is no longer attached to the parietal pleura with that surface tension, and it just stays there, so the lung doesn't expand. And if there's an air leak from the lung, or from the outside world, it's an open wound, and air sucks into that space on inhalation, it may not escape on exhalation. In fact, it probably won't. And so each time you, the patient inhales, they suck a little more air in there and more and more pressure builds up and that space between the, the visceral and parietal pleura get bigger and bigger. And finally, the lung collapses completely. And eventually, you may develop a tension pneumothorax, which we'll talk about. These are often closed injuries, so a rib fracture happens. There's no wound to the outside world, but the rib cuts the lung or the pleura. Or there may be a paper bag effect where there's sudden compressive force on the chest. Someone's holding their breath or the glottis is closed and pop, just like a paper bag. There can be open injuries as well with direct disruption of the pleura that do this. So your findings are typically evidence of trauma to the chest with difficulty breathing, I have seen many patients with pneumothoraxes, very big pneumothoraces that I can see on chest CAT scan, 40-50%, where I still hear breath sounds on the affected side because the air in the lung transmits the breath sounds from the other side. But they can be different, they can sound more high-pitched, uh, it can be very odd to hear them, or they can be normal. So if you hear absence of breath sounds on one side, or don't hear, I guess, as the case may be, or if you, if you hear abnormal breath sounds on the side of trauma, then consider that there may be a pneumothorax. So here we have two chest x-rays of pneumothoraces. On the left, you have a very small pneumothorax. The red arrow shows you the chest wall where the parietal pleura is, and the yellow arrow shows you the line. You can see that very faint and subtle line. It crosses over the ribs and keeps moving up and down. That is the edge of the lung and the visceral pleura, and in between those two is the air and the pleural space, the pneumothorax. If you look at the chest x-ray on the right, it's a full chest x-ray. You see the whole chest. The red arrow, again, indicating the chest wall and the parietal pleura. The yellow arrow is indicating the visceral pleura and the edge of the lung. Because the lung is partially collapsed, it's more white in appearance uh, on the right side there. And then there's that black area with a very distinct line separating it from the lung, and that shows you the pneumothorax in that space there. 
How do you manage in a simple pneumothorax like this? Well, the treatment, after you protect yourself, X, A, B, C, D, E, F. And these can occur in patients spontaneously too. They don't require trauma. And that's discussed under the respiratory emergencies, chest pain and shortness of breath session. But in, in the traumatic injuries, which is what we're talking about, you give them supplemental oxygen. The idea being that there may actually be some absorption of oxygen from that pneumothorax just dissolving through the walls the, of the, the pleura. It's very minimal, but that helps wash out the nitrogen. It also gets more oxygen into the patient's bloodstream in the event that the lung completely collapses. Uh, you have more oxygen on the other side to help get onto those, the red blood cells, and onto the hemoglobin on the other side. You want to talk to medical control about pain control is needed. You won't always need pain control for this, but often you will. These are painful. And evacuation, because you don't want to want to be sitting watching these patients for a day or so and then they develop a tension pneumothorax. So what is a tension pneumothorax? Well, you know what a pneumothorax is and you know that as air gets trapped in that space between the visceral and parietal pleura, it can push down the lung. But you can accumulate so much air that not only do you push down the lung, you actually push the mediastinum over into the unaffected side. So that's problematic for two reasons. One, you're starting to squish the good lung, and so that's not effectively ventilating. But much more importantly, the vena cava runs through the center of the chest, and the vena cava is a pretty weak vessel, and so it can bend over and kink. And when it does, it cuts off the return of blood flow to the heart. And when that happens, you end up in shock because there's really no blood in the heart and the heart itself gets compressed so it has trouble squeezing and the patient goes into shock because there's no blood return to the heart so it can't pump forward and the heart's not pumping well and those patients are wicked sick so if you've got a patient with chest trauma they're in shock they're in respiratory failure so severe difficulty breathing high heart rate potentially low blood pressure all the other findings of shock they may or may not have absent breath sounds it may sound very loud and high-pitched when you percuss the chest wall on the affected side. We haven't discussed percussion of the chest before, but you can do this. And if it sounds high-pitched like a drum, those are all signs of tension pneumothorax. Now, we have a saying in, in trauma care that you should never diagnose a tension pneumothorax by x-ray or by CT scan because you should be able to tell basis on the injury and the patient's physiologic pattern that they have a tension pneumothorax and treat it. But in these two cases, we did manage to get CAT scans and x-rays of tension pneumothoraces. So look at the red arrows on the CAT scan on the left. You can see the lung completely collapsed down and the mediastinum being pushed into the left chest cavity uh, with the right-sided pneumothorax. And on the chest x-ray there, you see a right-sided pneumothorax and you can see the mediastinum, the heart, and the great vessels pushed completely over into the left chest there. And uh, you can tell that the mediastinum in the chest is not working well. So obviously, a tension pneumothorax is a life-threatening event and needs to be treated as quickly as possible. So X, A, B, C, D, E, F, as always. But when you hit B, you're going to find that respiratory compromise, and C will tell you they're in shock. So contact medical control. The treatment is needle chest decompression, which we'll discuss, pain control and evacuation. And again, these are often multi-trauma patients, so manage other trauma as well. But be aware that this can recur and the breathing status can be compromised very quickly. So you need to be very alert for decompensation. So how do we treat a tension pneumothorax? Well, basically, we've got a balloon in the chest that's compressing the heart, the great vessels, and the good lung, we need to pop that balloon. And we do that with an angiocath, a needle with a catheter on it. We use a three and a half inch long and 14 gauge in size angiocath. Any shorter and chances are good, you won't make it all the way through the chest wall. And you need it to be that large so that you can allow air to come out in some blood without the catheter clotting off easily, although they all clot off eventually. So you locate the 
second intercostal space, top of the second rib. If you go into the third intercostal space and the top of the third rib, it's certainly not the end of the world. That's in the midclavicular line. You can also take an approach from the side of the chest where you go in in the fourth or fifth intercostal space in the mid-axillary line. You align your needle straight up and down and you go in over the top of the lower rib. So in the second intercostal space, that's the third rib, you go over the top because nerves, arteries, and veins run in a groove along the bottom of the ribs and you want to avoid hitting those. The catheter, needle and catheter, are then advanced over the rib and pushed all the way to the hub against the chest wall. The needle is then removed, leaving the catheter in place. You can see air and a small bubble of blood coming out. Bleeding with this is not uncommon, either because of getting into a small blood vessel or because the patient has a hemonumothorax where they have both blood and air in the chest cavity. Now, when blood comes out, it will eventually clot the catheter. And so the tension pneumothorax can develop again. But when you initially put this in, if air rushes out, you fix the problem, their shock should improve if the, the tension pneumothorax is the only cause of shock. And if that's the case, then you just continue to monitor them. And then if they develop shock again, you just put another needle in right beside the first one. So just like you get a pneumothorax with air, you can get a hemothorax with blood. And each side of the chest can hold 40% of your circulating blood volume, which means that if you have bilateral hemothoraces, you can lose most of your blood into your chest cavity and die from the hypovolemic shock just from that. So these patients are in shock and they have respiratory failure because the blood in that pleural space is collapsing the lung. Treatment, X, A, B, C, D, E, F. Talk to medical control. You're going to give IV fluids up to a permissive hypotension. Try to aim to get your blood pressure right around, uh, say, 80 to 90 systolic. And pretty likely you're going to end up doing chest decompression because you won't know if this is pneumothorax or hemothorax. Uh, and you need to evacuate all these patients. So other things you can do with your lungs, well, you can get a pulmonary contusion or a bruise of the lung. So you get a rapid deceleration. You fall, your chest wall strikes the floor and, or the ground, and your lung slams into your chest wall on the inside. The alveoli rupture, the blood goes into those spaces, they get edema and fluid in there, and they fill up. So if you've got somebody with chest trauma and severe respiratory distress, often in shock, treatment is X, A, B, C, D, E, F, positive pressure ventilation, evacuation, you're going to talk to medical control, you may well end up needing to do needle chest decompression here because you are not going to be able to distinguish in the very, very sick patient with chest trauma and shock, whether it's pulmonary contusion or hemothorax or attention pneumothorax. Patients can also get something called traumatic asphyxia, where they get a crush injury to their chest or even to their abdomen, which can push up on the, push up on the diaphragm and decrease the thoracic volume, increase intrathoracic pressure. But you get this massive increase in your intrathoracic pressure, and all the venous blood coming in in the superior and inferior vena cava gets pushed backwards. And the problem is it gets pushed backwards into the head. That's where it really causes injury. So your treatment is X, A, B, C, D, E, F. Elevate the head of the bed to 30 degrees unless contraindicated and evacuate these patients. But wait, you say, how would I know that my patient has this injury? Well, look at that chest. You see evidence of trauma directly to the chest. So, of course, you know you have a chest injury, and that makes you suspicious. And in this injury, there's back pressure in the veins, and that, of course, feeds to the capillaries, and there's so much pressure, the capillaries rupture. So if you look at your patient's face, what you see is all those little dots. That's where capillaries have ruptured all throughout the face, and you see some bleeding uh, in the whites of the eye, and that's from the back pressure to the blood as well. So if you have a chest injury and you've got those findings of petechiae, those little ruptured capillaries all over the face, that tells you that you're looking at traumatic asphyxia. So you can also get open chest wounds. Now remember how ventilation works. You've got negative pressure in your thorax. It sucks air into the trachea. If you get an open chest wound and air flows preferentially through that wound instead of through the trachea, 
you don't get oxygenation, you don't get ventilation. So what are you going to find? You're going to find an open chest wound, and when the patient breathes, it is going to suck through it, and they'll be in severe respiratory distress. So on your left, you see a fairly significant open chest wound from a direct blow to the chest. On the right, you see on the x-ray, you actually have a pneumothorax and collapsed lung. So the right-sided x-ray there, uh, right side of the x-ray shows that right lung to be collapsed. So how do you treat this? Well, you start with X, A, B, C, D, E, F. And what you really need to do is change the dynamics of airflow. Again, your problem is you've got air preferentially flowing through this wound on the side. I mean, there's other issues. There's the bleeding. There's the pneumothorax. But the real issue is air is preferentially sucking in through that wound. So you need to make it harder for air to get through that wound than it is to get through the trachea. So start by putting on big bulky dressings. And those big bulky dressings basically slow down airflow typically enough that you can now get decent flow through the trachea. After that, you can put on an occlusive dressing or plastic wrap. Uh, and you want to seal on three sides if you can so that you don't create a tension pneumothorax if there's a lung injury as well. But really the, the key the key is to do something to make airflow preferentially through the trachea, and that's typically big bulky dressings. You do this before you talk to medical control, because this is life-threatening. Then talk to medical control about pain management. You may even need to sedate these patients slightly, although you have to be very careful about respiratory compromise and evacuating them. These are fairly massive injuries. Although even a puncture wound could theoretically do this. In my experience, in puncture wounds, you tend to see pneumoth attention pneumothorax develop, and it takes a fairly significant injury to develop a sucking chest wound. If you get quite a bit of force transfer, you can get injuries to the heart and great vessels. So myocardial contusion or bruising of the heart is a problem. It can cause heart damage. It can cause a myocardial infarct if you form a clot in one of the coronary arteries. It can make the heart beat irregularly, uh, particularly fast heart rates. So typically this occurs with extensive chest injury, particularly to the sternum, and you may find they have an irregular heartbeat. Your treatment is X, A, B, C, D, E, F, EKG monitoring to see what the irregular heartbeat is, and evacuation. It's worth mentioning commotio cordis, which is why Little League and high school baseball players now wear sternum guards. This is the classic baseball player gets hit in the center of the chest and drops dead. What happens is there's a direct blow to the sternum, and it happens to hit just at the right time that the heart goes into an irregular rhythm. This is not tension pneumothorax or some other thoracic trauma. This is a direct electrical problem of the heart, so treat this like a standard cardiac arrest. Someone who gets struck directly in the center of their chest and drops dead immediately, and it's not a super high energy blow just treat it like a standard cardiac arrest. In pericardial tamponade, fluid fills the sac that surrounds the heart. The heart sits in the mediastinum, but it's not just hanging there rubbing against the lungs. It's surrounded by a sac called the pericardium. And if there's trauma that either injures a coronary artery or the ventricular wall gets injured and blood starts to leak out of the heart, it'll fill that sac. Now, the pericardium is fibrous and intact and it doesn't stretch at all so the heart gets compressed and can't beat and in someone who's previously healthy as little as 150 mls of blood can do this so your findings here are jugular venous distension because you can't push blood into the heart anymore so there's back pressure through the venous system and so the veins of the neck stick out if you can hear heart tones they may sound quieter than you would expect and something called the pulse pressure narrows, that is the systolic and diastolic blood pressure get closer and closer together because frankly the heart can't squeeze. And so even though the overall blood pressure is going down, the difference between the systolic and diastolic blood pressure gets closer and closer till it reaches a point where it's the same because there's frankly no squeeze at all. How do you treat pericardial tamponade? X, A, B, C, D, E, F. Give the patient supplemental oxygen as much as you can. Talk to medical control. 
if you're suspecting this, these people need lots of IV fluids to try to help the heart stretch as much as possible, and they need to be evacuated. And if this patient is in severe shock and they're, or they're in cardiac arrest, medical control may talk you through a procedure called pericardiosynthesis, where basically you stick a needle through the chest wall into the pericardium and drain out blood. So you're looking at a variant of pericardial tamponade here, and instead of it being blood causing the tamponade and squeezing down the heart, it's air. And this is a pneumopericardium. So on this chest x-ray, those yellow arrows are indicating the edges of the pleura where they reflect inwards on the median side of the lungs and make the mediastinum and the pericardium and those should be directly against the heart. You can see the big globular white heart in the center of the chest. Instead, there's a white space between the heart and those line, the linings of the pleura, and that's air trapped inside the pericardium that's squeezing down the heart. One of the most unfortunate injuries that can happen is traumatic aortic rupture, and this is a high-speed deceleration injury, so a fall from height, or a crush injury to the chest that's severe, a uh, motorcycle or vehicle accident where you've got an unrestrained passenger who's suddenly free, a free-flying object that then strikes a hard surface. And your heart basically hangs free in the chest by the aorta, and the aorta is attached with some ligaments. And so the heart swings forward and it tears the aorta where the aorta attaches to the chest wall. Uh, it's a very common cause of immediate death in high-energy traumatic injury. So 80 to 90 percent of people are dead right there. And if they don't die immediately, unless this is detected, they'll die within 24 hours. So they need immediate evacuation. So you can get a tear and you either bleed out into your chest and die immediately, or you get a contained hematoma where you bleed a bit and then it stops bleeding, and then within 24 hours it ruptures or completely compresses blood flow. Now, the only thing that's really going to be a clue if you find this, that this is what's going on, is differential blood pressures. So in the upper extremities, you may have very high blood pressure as the body tries to compensate for this injury to get blood flow through the whole body, and the lower extremities have no pulse at all because when the aorta ruptures, the bleeding compresses it and you don't get blood flow down into the legs. From left to right, you have an x-ray of the chest, and you've looked at a couple of these now. So you notice that you see the heart, but the mediastinum, instead of getting narrow on the top like it usually does, goes, seems to stay wide all the way to the top of the chest, and that's because there's blood in that area. The image in the middle is called an aortogram. There's a little catheter in coming in through the left subclavian artery there and squirting dye into the aorta, and you can see how the aortic arch starts at the heart on the right side, comes across to the left, and is going down, and that's patient right and left. So for your screen, that'd be left and right. And then all of a sudden, it looks like there's a cutoff, and that's where the aorta is ruptured. And the image on the far right of the screen shows an aorta, obviously in someone who didn't make it, that was torn with a lot of bleeding into the wall. So unless you have that finding of high blood pressure or normal blood pressures in the upper extremities or in the right arm only and no pulses or low blood pressures in the left arm or left arm in both legs or pulselessness in the left arm or just the lower extremities, you're not really going to know that this is what has happened. Uh, but you're going to treat it like a severe thoracic injury. You start with X, A, B, C, D, E, F. Talk to medical control about IV fluids and evacuation for these patients. And penetrating chest trauma can be actually fairly subtle. This nail through the patient's chest, you can see the spike on the picture on the left, and you can see where it is next to the nipple. This actually went all the way through to the patient's pericardium and caused pericardial tamponade that needed to be drained. Here's a patient who suffered a gunshot wound to the chest. You can see the gunshot wound on the picture on the left, the first patient, that's fairly obvious, although it's a small wound. The one on the right is a very minor injury, and you might miss that if you didn't do a really good job in exposing the patient and finding their injuries. Here's an x-ray of a patient complaining of stabbing chest pain to the right side of her chest. 
Never remove an impaled object, even if it is a big old knife. Please complete any associated knowledge reviews, and if you have any questions, contact your professor or instructor. Thank you very much.